apparently the Scientology organization is being sued by the United States government, and then uh, Hubbard claims this criminal act conspiracy and operations against the U.S. and private citizens, et cetera, et cetera. And then we get down to fair game policies and disconnecting. And, mm -hmm. and how do these all these fit in from the 1960s until uh, the present, or at least as far as you know it? Well, as far as like the R245, we'll cover that in the, in the fair game policy. Uh, the uh, R245 uh, occurred, uh, I believe, in uh, December... 54, 53, uh, and he was at a Congress. Uh, a Congress would be like a convention, Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, all of the delegates were there, all of the attendees and members. And I was standing in the wings, and uh, he pulls out a Colt 45 semi-automatic pistol. Uh, that's your father? Yes, my father pulled it out. It's a 1911 Army model. I remember he had it for years. He stole it from the Navy. Anyway, um, he also stole a machine gun, a Thompson submachine gun from the Australian government, which he kept for years until the Australian government tracked it down and told him to give it back. Anyway, he uh, all of a sudden, with total surprise, with his right hand, just pointed a gun at the floor and fired it. And... Uh, it is said here, uh, in later when it was wrote, writ, wrote wow, written up by uh, uh, Alfie Hart, the editor of the journal mag uh, magazine during the 50s, that it was a blank, but it wasn't, because later on I happened to see the hole in the floor. Uh, but R245 was a one-shot, as he said from the stage then, a, a one-shot clearing process, uh, a... Uh, particularly useful on psychiatrists, and uh, uh, everybody is laughing. Of course, when the gun went off, everybody jumped about a foot in the air in a lot of confusion because it was a pretty good-sized hall, and, and a lot of people in the back really couldn't see the gun because it, it came out so quickly. Um, and uh, everybody is laughing kind of nervously. And as he came off the stage towards me, uh, uh, I'm laughing and uh, uh, about it, and he looks me right in the eye and he says, "I mean it." Now, so a permanent clear is when someone is permanent shot in the clear, head. right? You know, uh, that's. Uh, but if the whole thing is is uh, quick exteriorization, that is, leaving uh, having an instant out of the body and permanent uh, experience, an instant uh, clearing, uh, and. Uh, through the 50s, it was, at least I considered it, to be uh, uh, a joke. But then later, as he, he got very serious about things that I thought in the beginning were jokes. And uh, uh, that was one of them. And the, uh, the various policies of disconnect, we had a slightly different one. You must realize one thing here that many if not most of the basic very basic policies of the of uh, scientology uh, that are now written weren't written then they were practiced first and then later on at some time written so you will find a lot of things that i am talking about and other people throughout the 50s talking about that was a standard routine operating procedure but it just wasn't a written down thing and uh, later it was written down and what he would term codified. And uh, uh, the fair game policy, he's had that as, uh, as long as uh, I've known him. That's the attack the attacker, fair game That's policy. That's correct. Sue and trick or destroy. No, it's and destroy attack. the attacker. No, it's That's injure, it. sue, trick or destroy. And uh, there's, only, uh, there's only one good defense, and that's to attack, quote, unquote. Um, I want to okay, and uh, I'm trying to get through this so that we can all get a chance to question it further, but the blown student is the uh, policy to uh, kidnap a student that tries to leave. Oh, yeah, I invented that. You invented that? Sure. Uh, tell, me about, tell me about it. Oh, well, let me back it up slightly by saying this. Okay. Uh, I 
ran as chief instructor uh, about two dozen advanced clinical courses. Those were six-week courses. I ran the very first one, and starting in about 1953, I set up all of the training routines and all the training programs uh, I invented and put them together. Uh, I started doing the training at the age of 18 in um, <clears throat> 19, uh, 1952. Uh, my father gave me a set of tapes that I hadn't heard, and I'm 18 years old, and he says, here, teach these, I'm going to London. And I said, well, I don't know what they say. He says, well, just listen to them yourself and then talk about them to the students. Now, here's an 18-year-old guy that went to three high schools, never graduated from any one of them. Uh, who uh, had never studied the subject, and now I am the chief instructor and, and uh, the chief uh, training officer in Phoenix, Arizona in 1952. There was only one other man in the office, Althea Hart. And uh, so here I am at, a, at what uh, my father called Hubbard College. Okay, that's the way I learned it. In fact, most of the tapes and lectures I, that you see clear through the 50s in the United States, and quite a number of them in England, it was that I was there when those lectures were made live. What the procedure was that he would give the lecture, give me a slight outline, and then I would stand up and teach what I just heard. Uh, so I got very good at, uh, at uh, double talk and being pretty glib. Also, uh, it was up to me to formulate and set up all of the training programs, all of the training courses. Uh, I originated the grind, which I don't know if you hear that word today or not, but that was like 8 o'clock in the morning for students to uh, 10 o'clock at night, seven days a week. You just ground them into the ground. Okay. Uh, you also must realize that at that time I was pretty fat, sassy, and brassy. And uh, as I was referred to earlier about the exercise of power, I mean, here's a kid 18, 20, 21, 22, who are teaching people that are doctors, lawyers, uh, uh, rich people, uh, even ones like the member of DuPont family, things like that. And so you could really exercise power. They did what I told them to do or else. And I ran them ragged. I was probably equal to uh, or even rougher and tougher than a Marine DI, and that's not an exaggeration. Okay, as far as blown students was, I was a big ego tripper. Nobody blew my courses. In fact, even a few times I handcuffed them to their chairs. And uh, uh, I originated that, uh, that there's a basic thing uh, with uh, uh, the road out is the road through is a very early pre-religious thing, uh, statement of that. So the thing to do was to continue with continue with the course, continue with the training. So they had to finish it. And, and uh, I was pretty good physically, and uh, somebody run out on me, I went and got them. And if I took me a half a dozen other guys to go get them, I got them. And they came back several times and dragged them back by their feet, you know, and just sit down. A uh, good friend of mine, he, I still know him, uh, I chased him down the street. He locked himself in his apartment. Uh, I just knocked the door down with a smash and a crunch, grabbed him by the collar and drug him screaming all the way back and threw him in the auditing chair, in the, in the uh, training chair. So blown student, that's where that comes from. You, that originated the uh, 18, 20 hour training schedules, the, uh, the uh, uh, heavy uh, SS style uh, training methods. Okay, we've gotten 